David DeRoche is a professor at the Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies at the National Defense University. He joins us from Washington as well. David, welcome to the program. Uh, is this an act of desperation uh, by Vladimir Putin to put Russia's nuclear deterrent forces on high alert? Well, there's no other way to explain it. I mean, uh, uh, Putin uh, has been fond of reminding people uh, when he behaves like a third world country that he has a first world nuclear arsenal. And so given um, that his forces are not achieving the success that he expected them to achieve, I think that this is uh, to be predicted. Uh, it's not to be welcomed, but certainly I, I think that uh, everybody saw it coming. Do you think it's another possible example of a miscalculation that Putin and his closest aides have made in launching this attack in Ukraine? Because if you have an aim of demilitarization of an entire country, surely that might suggest that actually you may never achieve your aim and you'd have to occupy that nation. Yeah, uh, I think uh, that he was uh, misled uh, either willfully or by his subordinates on a number of um, areas. One is, I think, that he projected the Crimea, which is, you know, ethnically Russian, that he thought all of Ukraine would be like that and that he would be able to basically just walk in, uh, you know, maybe deal with a few riots to take over the country. I think the second miscalculation is there appears to be a level of corruption in the Russian armed forces that he seems to have been unaware of. Capabilities that didn't really exist, probably ghost soldiers who, you know, weren't really there, but uh, whose paychecks was being commanded by or pocketed by commanders. Um, clearly, the military capabilities are not as they were reported to him. And then finally, I think he himself has made a strategic miscalculation. He says he's frightened of NATO. Well, you know, now you have um, an alliance that as recently as 2014, you know, there were no American tanks left in Germany. They had all been withdrawn. But now you see uh, Sweden and Finland trying to join NATO. You see Germany uh, with a record uh, defense bill uh, revigorizing its thing. And, uh, you know, all the eastern NATO countries uh, basically calling for a revitalized military uh, 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 alliance. So this is a, a strategic miscalculation of the first order. Do you not think that his next step, the only option would appear to be, let's increase the level of attacks? In fact, 24 hours ago, the Russian army was given that order, broaden your offensive from all directions. Because if it is indeed about 70, 80, 90,000 of those 200,000 odd soldiers who would fight on behalf of Russia, if only that amount, say even 50% so far, have advanced into Ukraine, there's still another 100,000 to go. Would yeah. that not be his that's, logical next step? Yeah, yeah, that's 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 a good insight. Um, so, you know, what you see here is that, quite frankly, the military plan was not really based for military action. Uh, what he thought was that he was pushing on an open door and it would only take a token military force to achieve his political goal, which is regime change in the Ukraine. Now that he knows he has to fight for regime change in the Ukraine, the advantages of the Russian uh, military are mass, uh, which he can bring to bear, although it will take longer than he expects it to because of the uh, uh, really poor logistics of them. So first mass and second firepower. And, uh, you know, what he wants to do is create a condition of psychological terror among Ukrainians. He uh, doesn't have the manpower to individually go in and occupy cities that are defended. So he will do what the, what the Red Army did in 1945 and just conduct standoff bombardment of cities trying to induce terror there that will lead to what he thinks is a Ukrainian capitulation. How much do you think the uh, lethal assistance that uh, Western nations have been sending to Ukraine has helped over the past four days? When you look at what the Ukrainian government says the Russians have lost, I mean, we're talking about more than 1,000 pieces of Russian military hardware and 4,300 mm -hmm. soldiers. None of that is independently verifiable, of course, but there's no right. doubt that the Russians are suffering. Yeah. Well, just knowing it's out there creates a situation. So if uh, you know that there are Javelin anti-tank missiles out there, um, you can't just, you know, send one, two, three vehicles off down the road and uh, move as fast as you can on Kiev. You have to establish local security. You have to put dismounts out. And uh, another weakness of the Russian armed forces that are attacking is they are used to operating with local insurgents as their local security force. Well, you have those in Luhansk. You don't have those in the attack on, on Kiev. So these forces have no local security force. Knowing that there's an effective anti-tank missile in the mix, 
they have to slow down. They have to move, uh, you know, have to commit more of their force to internal security and less of their force to offensive action. So it's significant, even if it doesn't actually kill significant numbers of tanks. David, uh, the uh, Russians, according to the Ukrainians, have agreed to meet on the border with Belarus and to do so without preconditions. The Ukrainian foreign minister says that alone is a victory for Ukraine because there had been conditions that the Russians had put on yep. possible talks. And one of those conditions was for the Ukrainian military to lay down their weapons. That hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. What do you think of these mm -hmm. talks and the timing of them taking place? Yeah, it's, well, it's a good question. I mean, the other, the other condition was that the talks were supposed to take place in Minsk, which is a party to this conflict. So, so basically, the Russian initial negotiating position was surrender, and then we'll talk about the terms of your surrender. So, yeah, I think it is a victory for the Ukrainians that they're agreeing to meet on what is um, not neutral terrain, but at least is uh, not terrain that's controlled by either side. And I think that, uh, you know, it amounts to uh, Russian political recognition, first off, that they don't control the battlefield. Secondly, that they can't dictate the terms, at least now. And then third, that Belarus is, in fact, a party to this conflict. All of these fictions have been these are capitulations by Putin. Yeah, absolutely. The Ukrainians have just said about 20 minutes or so ago that uh, some missiles have actually been launched from Belarusian territory. So I don't know how that's going to Lost affect sound. the talks that are taking place right now. David, really, really appreciate the analysis. Thank you so much indeed. David DeRoche there speaking to us from Washington.